Hey, what's up everyone? This is Patrick. Thank you for uh, rev tuning into this review of day three of my experience at the Tony Robbins Platinum Partnership Finance event up here in Sun Valley, Idaho. Uh, this day was by far the most packed with information. I'm going to try to keep it brief, but I, I learned quite a bit and there was some interesting insertion of uh, or inserting of information that I wasn't expecting and I had heard it before, but it made an even a bigger impact for me. Uh, and so I'm going to share, share that, but there were some speakers that went back to back that had kind of polar opposite views in a sense of where things were going. And it was fascinating to see that dynamic and how much that not only uh, it, it inspired my new level of thinking, but the audience as well. Uh, so let's uh, let's get into it. So the first speaker right out of the gate was was Ray Dalio. Uh, Ray Dalio is a, a good friend of Tony's and has be, become very successful. He wrote a book called uh, Principles, which I've referenced uh, often on the podcast. There were some great nuggets in there in regards to uh, investing, business, and, and just life in general. So definitely check that out. Uh, but Ray's Ray's message wasn't necessarily something that was outside of the video I've already mentioned, which is how the economic machine uh, works. Uh, but here are a few things that I that I took away. First, he made essentially a not a prediction, but a statement around where we're at in the the debt cycle. Uh, and that relates to his his video that I've referenced now a few times. Uh, he said that we're late in the short uh, debt cycle, the short-term debt cycle, and even later in the long-term debt cycle, but not quite, uh, not quite to the the point where there's a correction and disruption. Uh, I would say because of the it's kind of a QE four in a sense, which is the uh, the the Fed's involvement in the repo market. Uh, and this has to do with bank liquidity and banks have to keep a certain amount of reserves. And if they don't have those reserves, they usually will borrow it from other banks. But over the last six, nine months or so, that liquidity has uh, has shrank. And so the Fed has gotten involved. And so now the Fed is providing this stimulus. It's lending against high value assets of a bank and injecting even more liquidity uh, into uh, into the market. So it's it's really interesting how they've done that, but it isn't necessarily manifesting in, in, in inflation and huge amounts of growth. And that's because the inflation is really in the financial assets, not necessarily in goods and services. Uh, and, and so that was a very in interesting, interesting insight. Uh, but he made a, a point about China, going to another topic he mentioned. China, he, he said that China doesn't really care about the, the, the trade disruption that they've had over the last, you know, last year or so with regards to the, the Trump administration. He said that's not necessarily a big concern for them. Their biggest priority and biggest concern is technology, right? They, they believe that the, the leader in technology is the one that's going to essentially control economies, the global economy. So that's where China has been, uh, been focused. And also the, the dilemma is that the, the U.S. and China is very intertwined in regards to its technology as far as the demand. But also I would say there's a huge uh, demand of the, the different technologies that the U.S. has that's all manufactured in, in China, uh, which I think is interesting. Uh, in addition, he made mention of quantum computing. Quantum computing is one of those one of those. Uh, races that companies are in uh, similar to 5g uh, and google has made some stride toward uh, having uh, economical uh, quantum computing uh, but he had said that china is is ahead of the game he ahead of any company in uh, in the united states which i thought was uh, which i thought was interesting now it's going to come down to the power needed to uh, to you know, have these quantum computers run, which is uh, an exorbitant amount of power. But uh, I would say part of the race is figuring out how to make that economical. Uh, and then the last thing I'll mention is the idea that you know China is really trying to disrupt 
the global economy and take over leadership. And that's going to be based on its control over technology. Okay, so that's one of the things that uh, that Ray had mentioned. Uh, the next thing was the idea of tactical investment. He said that uh, tactical, tactical investment, technical investment, trading, trying to ride, ride short positions, ride long positions. It's one of the most difficult games that's out there. And so he said that the average investor uh, has way more to gain by diversification. And so in in Tony's book, you know, Money Master the Game, one of the the uh, takeaways from his interview with Ray uh, and what Tony uh, had Ray help him with is the creation of a portfolio that's called the all weather portfolio, which is a kind of a combination of different assets. I think there's some there's bonds in there, there's gold, there's commodities. Uh, and what those what those assets are is when one goes up, the other goes down. And there's I think there's about five or six type of asset classes in that portfolio, where as things fluctuate in the economy, uh, the global economy, then it's able to kind of counterbalance in, in a sense. Uh, and I've actually back tested. I've, I've created a whole uh, you know spreadsheet with a guy on my team. Uh, we back tested you know for I think like 50, 50 years, uh, and you know it does uh, it, it it does work. I think that the the gross yield was around eight uh, percent, and obviously you have to net out uh, fees. Uh, but that's an internal return, which is uh, which is which is really interesting. But anyway, that, it's called the all all weather portfolio, uh, and so he not only mentioned that, but also to diversify into other asset classes. He said that the ideal diversification is across at least fifteen different uh, non correlated assets. Uh, okay, la- a couple of last things he he mentioned that there's you know going to continue to be more stimulus. Obviously, we're seeing in the repo markets. At the same time, there. Uh, there's still a tiny bit of room, but he believes that there's just going to be continual uh, printing, especially this year being an election year. Uh, and then the wealth gap. He made mention that this is one of the biggest concerns. It's it's where he is uh, putting a lot of his fi- uh, philanthropic focus is into into this wealth gap. Uh, right now, 40% of the United States uh, can't come up with $400 which is really concerning. And so if you look at, uh, you know, Andrew Yang really pushing universal basic income and, uh, and also just, you know, the Bernie Sanders and his uh, message, which is, you know, anti-establishment, but very socialistic is attracting, you know, uh, the, the, you know, I would say the, uh, the, the, the lower tail of our socio, uh, you know, socio economy. Uh, and it's, it's concerning to him because that gap continues to, to broaden and it really comes down to what I'd said a moment ago, which is the financial asset inflation, where that has made individuals very wealthy uh, at, the, at the top, but it's, it has uh, really not helped those that are, uh, that are at the bottom. And uh, Ray wrote an article on LinkedIn with, uh, about universal basic income and his study. Uh, so if you guys want to check that out, we'll link to that in the show notes. And let's see, that's it. That's all. That's Ray. All right. So the next, the next thing, which is what I mentioned in the beginning, which is uh, an, uh, not necessarily an intervention, but there was a woman who who stood up and was, you know, talking about you know her investments, what she was taking away, and what she uh, was trying to determine as far as some of her next steps in business. And Tony did something, and I've I've heard this before. I've come across it, but he went into way more detail, and something something really hit home to me. And I've been talking about this a lot over the last several podcasts which is this, this idea of where your focus is when it comes to uh, your future uh, and the decisions that you, that you make. Uh, so he has a six-step decision-making process. And I looked online, and there are several resources available. There's a kind of a, a Fortune magazine article that discusses it in detail. Uh, but there is, uh, it calls it the o- O-O-C-E-M, uh, E-M-R. So the OOC is kind of a, a step, uh, step by step. Uh, the first three steps being uh, how to start to identify the basis of your decisions, which is uh, these are all acronyms, of course. So it's outcome, options, and then consequences. So like outcome is first, which is really getting crystal clear of the outcome you want. What are the results? That you're after getting clarity, crystal, crystal clear of exactly what those outcomes, those results are. Let me get into my notes. Get in my notes here. (sighs) 
uh, so I'll, I'll kind of go through some of some of the notes that I took. So what, what is the result you're after? Why do you want to achieve it? Getting clear about outcomes and their order of importance. So you just start listing out, listing out. It's kind of a kind of a brain dump in a sense. That's what he was having this woman do. Uh, then options, write down all of your options, whatever comes to mind. He says that one option is not uh, a choice. Two options is a dilemma. And three options is where you really do have a choice. So it's coming up with as many of those options as uh, as possible. Uh, and he also said that in, you know it should include the the you know that they may be far fetched type of uh, uh, options. Okay, on options that you know you may just think is crazy, but listing all of them out. And there's a whole a process to this once you've done on it, done it. So outcomes, all of your different options, and then the consequences is the next one. So OOC is the uh, acronym. So outcomes, options, and then consequences. So what are the upsides? So consequences is obviously positive and negative consequences. So what's the upsides and what are the downsides of each option? Uh, what do you gain by each option and what would it cost you? So answering those questions as it relates to all of your options. And um, then finally, it's evaluate. So now you go back and you evaluate all the options and the consequences. And if it does, uh, in fact, get you what you want as an outcome, um, and then start to rank rank those in order of uh, importance based on the upsides and downsides. And then uh, then uh, probability. What is the probability that it will that it will happen? That this option will actually work? What that does, it now kind of gives you. Uh, an idea of what are the, what is the specific direction uh, as it relates to the, the decisions you're going to make. Uh, then finally, it's uh, mitigate. So as you review the downsides uh, of all, you kind of brainstorm uh, alternative uh, alternative ways to eliminate or reduce the downsides, right? So which is which is important. Uh, because as you kind of review, okay, if I have a downside, you list the downside, but then, okay, how can I get rid of the downside? How can I mitigate, uh, mitigate the risk of a downside? Uh, and then finally it's, uh, resolving. So it's kind of going back through and, uh, selecting the best option based on the ways in which you've been able to rank and categorize them. So it was, it was fascinating. And this was probably, I would say on at least an hour long type of discussion with this woman in front of everybody. And, you know, she had multiple breakthroughs, breakthroughs being, she got to this point where it's like, Oh, I can, okay, I can do this. I can do this. You can really see her, like her mind starting to expand, right? Because it's that whole, you know, whole quote of the, the mind that got you to where you are is not the mind that's going to get you beyond. So it's really opening up that mind, breaking through thresholds and, yeah, and being able to figure out, all right, what is a decision I can make right now that will get me closer to the results that I'm after? So that was fascinating. I loved, I really love that. All right, I'm going to end with, you know, I have just a few, few more minutes. I'm trying to keep these into about 15 minute chunks. Uh, but it was, uh, two speakers that really was, again, the, uh, the the polar opposites, the polarity that existed between their perspective of the world uh, was fascinating, especially they were back to back. And and, he, and Tony did this by design. But the first is uh, Harry Dent. Now, Harry has uh, spoken at Tony's uh, conferences for a really long time. And he does it because Harry Dent has, you know, some track record issues. There are a lot of uh, calls that he's made in his books uh, that have actually not come to fruition or were early or were late. And, and it's happened, you know, for, for several decades now. Uh, and, you know, Harry took a stand with Dent Research, uh, which is a part of the Agora Network, uh, several several years ago, where he started writing newsletters. So it wasn't these books that he would come out with and then write about how the future looks like this and this and this, where his writing through a newsletter, uh, a publishing business, business would allow more... Uh, more accuracy, he'd be able to course correct quicker, which I think is very, very smart. Uh, but regardless, this is what Harry said regarding the future. He said that there is going to be a downturn. Harry is written often about uh, demographics and the spending of demographics, uh, their their net worth and where their asset concentrations are. And he basically said that right now we are uh, getting to uh, we're either at or beyond the peak of baby boomer spending. Uh, so the baby boomer started in 1946, going to 1964. That's kind of the uh, the, the the years in which a baby, the baby boomer dra- uh, demographic was born. Uh, and right now we're getting to that, like you know, almost 60 years old, right? Where it's the end of the baby end of the baby boomers. 
and their spending peak after their kids are, you know, their empty nesters, uh, their, you know, parents are finally, you know, free. That's when they start to spend, uh, spend a lot of money. That's what's going on right now, but that's going to come to a close very soon. Uh, so he said that plus the behavior of, of youth. And I've talked about the greatest wealth transfer in history, which is, uh, set to come in the next, you know, uh, probably 10 years, 15 years, uh, some within five, some within 10, and even more within 15, uh, you know, amounting to, to tens of trillions of dollars, right? It, it's going to be a different buying behavior of this younger demographic, different assets. They're also in a different financial situation, whether it's the debt that they have, uh, the professions that they have. So it'll be very interesting to see where money flows once this wealth tra uh, transfer starts to take place. Uh, and so he basically said that, you know, being in cash is a good thing. You'll, you'll be able to take advantage of opportunities. He sees major disruption uh, in 2022. And Dent Research has, you know, multiple newsletters. I think they have a free newsletter as well. If you guys want to, you know, follow, follow them. Uh, and then finally, uh, he, he mentioned that... Uh, a lot of the opportunity from an investment standpoint is in uh, healthcare, specifically care to those that are aging. So whether that's nursing homes, assisted living, you know, there's obviously tons of private investments out there, but a lot, but there's a lot of public investment out there as well. Uh, several ETFs or REITs, real estate investment trusts, that concentrate and focus on, you know, essentially different types of housing and real estate for an aging demographic. All right, so that was Harry. And Harry's a very entertaining speaker, uh, somewhat crude in moments. Uh, at the same time, he was very enter entertaining. Uh, one of my buddies, uh, Matt Atkinson, I need to get Matt on the podcast one of these, one of these days. Uh, you, he has a very distinct laugh. And so he was sitting <laughs> probably toward, toward the back from where I was sitting. And you can hear his, <laughs> hear his distinct laugh several times throughout Harry's uh, comments. Uh, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Uh, let's talk about Peter Diamandis. So here's what's cool. So Peter essentially said at the end that all of his slides, uh, which I, al I already have, uh, will can be made available to anybody. Uh, so we can share those. And so I, uh, I'm going to post a link for you guys to download those slides on the show notes. Make sure you go to thewealthstandard.com into this specific episode, and uh, there'll be a link there to download. Uh, and... It, Man, he is, he is a, he's a thinker, and uh, I'm not going to spend a, a ton of time going into uh, my notes my notes there, but Peter, I, I first read Peter's book, Abundance, so he has Abundance, uh, and then Bold, and he has uh, a new book, I think it's called The Future is Faster Than You Think, I'm not, I don't know if that's exactly, maybe I'll have my notes here, let's see. I'll post I'll post a link to his new uh, to his new book. But anyway, I read Peter's you know abundance book in uh, I think it was about two thousand nine two thousand and ten where it was a very uh, it was a dark time for a lot of people, including myself. And look, you know, there was pessimistic views as far as what was happening within you know within mark excuse me within markets. And Peter wrote a book about you know, essentially how incredible the, the times were, that things were so much better in the past. There was so much innovation going on. Again, this was, you know, 10, 10 years ago. And that the world was getting better. And he had all sorts of proof of how it was getting better. Uh, and I love that mindset because he knows what's going on. He knows that there's pessimism. But one of the quotes he used was that, uh, you know, a negative mind will, will, all, will never give you a positive life, which I love. Uh, because it's always been that way and always will be that way. There's always going to be a glass that's half uh, half empty. And I think if, if well, I know if focus is there, that's where you, your emotions and your feelings are going to focus. And that's regardless of the circumstances, because 2010, those dark times was an amazing time if that's the mindset that you had. Uh, there was tons of opportunities, whether it was real estate or uh, other types of investments, business investment. And since then, it's been this huge boom. Uh, so I love I love how Peter thinks. But again, as I said, the polarity between a very pessimistic view of things and then a very optimistic view of things was was healthy. And I think it helped broaden not just my perspective, but uh, a lot of those that were in the in the room. So a few of the things that Peter Peter mentioned, you guys will be able to get into the slides uh, and really dig into just some of the amazing innovation that's going on. That right now we are in this ex exponentially uh, growing 
uh, society where it was Moore's law before now it's like the acceleration of acceleration. So it's this quantum type of uh, leap, uh, it, you know, toward the future. That's how growth is what, you know, what growth is like. Uh, and also it provides a lot of opportunity because he cited some uh, polls of just a simple question, is the world getting better? And 6% of the US uh, believes that it is. <laughs> so 94% uh, doesn't think that the world is getting better. But he had, has all sorts of statistics on poverty being cut in half just in the last decade, uh, child mortality going down, famine going down. Half the world is using the internet. Uh, there is now uh, almost 800 million more people in the last decade that have electricity, uh, renewable energy. There's 10 times more solar power now than there was in just the last decade. Uh, then he kind of gets into the future, right? The future being driven uh, by artificial intelligence and, bi and biotech. And he said that the concentration really as far as, you know, understanding where the future is going is uh, energy, information, and material. Uh, the combination of which is going to create better lives for everybody, but also an extreme amount of wealth for those that know how to ride those waves. Uh, he, he mentioned personalized drugs. So uh, CRISPR which I've known about for a really long time, uh, is a way in which a map is created for the human genome, uh, being able to have different ways in which you can edit uh, and improve genetic disorders. So it's, fa it's fascinating. And some of this might be scary as well. And I know most of some of you were thinking that. A lot of the crowd, that's a way in th which they responded. I'm not going to get into that though. Uh, 3D printing. Uh, Tony uh, Tony invested in a, a, a 3D printing home building company in Mexico, who I think they have he has two printers now, uh, but they're able to build I think like two or three homes a day, and they're ten thousand dollars each. Uh, and again, it's a 3D printed home. Fa fascinating. Uh, he's uh, talking about uh, talked about rockets and how. You know, SpaceX and other companies are now, you know, being able to capitalize on either putting satellites in that provide a 5G type of uh, internet globally. Uh, and anyway, the digitizing, digitizing of factories, which is going to bring uh, costs down, but also it's going to de decrease dependence on, uh, you know, foreign manufacturing. Uh, and right now we're, we're seeing that with the coronavirus and how that's disrupted supply chain. Uh, and when we have, I don't think we are yet to see the impact of that. Some are saying that it could be an impact that lasts longer than a year, uh, just in disruption of supply chain over the last just couple of weeks, month. Uh, so 3D printing is going to essentially help the uh, you know, help us to you know, create uh, factories on site where you can 3D print parts as opposed to having to manufacture and shipping costs and, and you know, the, the, the use of you know, fuel and energy for that shipping and so forth. So anyway, fascinating. He talked about flying cars, that uh, you know, there'll be Ubercopter in Dallas. He also spoke uh, about uh, Kobe Bryant's helicopter going down and the, the older style of helicopter make make that type of flying very dangerous but the more modern ways in which bell and other uh, other companies are creating copters with multiple blades multiple propellers which uh, highly mitigate the probability of crashing and he said that uh you know by 2021 uh it, you know uh, elon musk thinks that there's going to be fully autonomous fully autonomous you know flying vehicles that can be uh commercialized Anyway, fascinating. Boston Dynamics, he posts a video about this jumping, you know, robot that Boston Dynamics uh, has created. And, you know, it's, it's amazing what it is able to be, it's able to do. Now it's just a matter of, you know, bringing down, bringing down costs. Oh, okay. What else? Um, yeah, just the artificial intelligence. Man, there's so, there's just so much that Peter said. You guys can revert, revert to uh, you know, revert to the slides, but artificial intelligence is just going to make decision making so much more accurate and the redu reduction of error and the reduction of time and energy spent on making decisions. Information will be provided based on trends, based on patterns. 
uh, 5G. Uh, there's a guy that spoke, I may talk about him tomorrow, uh, but he spoke about uh, how, he's, how he's created an unlicensed 5G network where you could put up a tower anywhere uh, if you own the real estate, right? If you have a building, you can put up a 5G tower and it has the ability to circum, uh, you know, circumnavigate buildings and so forth and create a beam of, of uh, internet at 5G quality for, for $6,000 and it can uh, give access to over 500 for each tower, uh, I think 500 households. And he says that if you network like 30 towers, you can essentially provide 5G to an entire city. Anyway, it's fa fascinating, which obviously we, we, we don't know what the impact is gonna be of uh, you know, these different frequencies and how that'll impact the, the body. But, but based on this guy's innovation, It'll highly reduce the number of towers, even reduce the number of towers that exist right now to provide that type of internet uh, at that at those speeds. Uh, and so, uh, OneWeb is that satellite, you know, satellite company, and I can't remember the name of the five G company. I think it's like um, uh, Teravar, or uh, I, I can't remember. I'll, I'll post it in the show notes. Uh, anyway, yeah, quantum computing. He talked about that as well, uh, but it's uh, yeah, and human longevity what we're being able to do there, it, it's fascinating. So Peter has Abundance 360 with just his conference. He also uh, has what's called the X Prize. X Prize is essentially putting a prize out there to uh, to to whoever wants to uh, tackle that. And whoever does gets, you know, some of the prizes are, are 10 million. Uh, he has a $100 million prize right now, uh, which I'll leave to the uh, to the slides for you guys to check out. All right, guys, that's it. Uh, that's it for today. Packed with information. Hopefully this is, you know, uh, sparks some interest in different areas that you guys can go out and, and investigate. Uh, but it was, uh, it was, it was awesome. This has been an incredible conference so far. I can't wait to uh, follow up with day with day four uh, and a summary. And I think that might be it because I believe day five is going to be uh, more just kind of wrap up and integration. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to this episode and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye. Hey everyone, Patrick here. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up this amazing event. I've been on the road for 10 days. I'm ready to go home, but it has, uh, it's, it's been, it's been life-changing. These are environments where your, your mind is almost forced to expand both with what you're being taught by the speakers and guests, uh, as well as all the conversation that takes place afterwards. And there are a lot of very high level people here. So it's been, it's been amazing. I'm still processing everything. Day, day four was, was no, was no exception. All, every single day has been packed full of amazing content, amazing people and ideas that just, it make you, they make you think different. And I think those are, those are environments that, you know, serve, serve everyone. Uh, I, I don't, I don't believe growth takes place in, uh, passive environments, environments that you're used to. Growth takes place in environments that challenge you, uh, not just physically, but but mentally as well. Uh, so I'm gonna go through just a, a few of the speakers and uh, and wrap this thing up. So the morning, uh, actually, we all we started uh, around noon every day because uh, most people would would ski and so forth in the in the morning. Uh, but we we opened day four with Paul Tudor Jones. This is a guy that that Tony Robbins has coached for really long time, decades, and is one of the most successful uh, traders out there. Uh, for, the, for those of you who have not heard of him, he founded uh, Robinhood, uh, which is you know a, a platform that has raised just billions of dollars uh, under the, the banner of uh, low, low fees, automation, and so forth. Uh, so he's been very successful with those entrepreneurial invent, uh, ventures, uh, but also uh, trading as well. So a few of the things that he said. So I want to set some context to his remarks because he was actually at the airport on his way to the Federal Reserve. He was on their advisory board uh, or, or the advisory board was going to uh, be hearing from him. He's, he had prepared some some words and some statements for them. So that that was his mindset. So it's, it's really interesting. Some of the things he said. First off, he said we we are uh, well, let me back up the member, the, the uh, kind of managing or, or governing member of this specific panel that he was going to talk to uh, wants higher inflation. 
Uh, he wants uh, he wants growth, and and so what uh, what Paul was saying was that we are we're we're in unprecedented times because we have uh, the lowest interest rates really in history. We have the lowest unemployment uh, almost in history, but we have the highest budget deficits. And right now, it's very difficult to cut. As I mentioned a few days ago, Eric Prince of Blackwater said that the U.S. needs a, needs to go on, you know, a, a diet. Uh, we, we need to, to experience scarcity in order to uh, expose the waste and get rid of the waste. But but uh, Paul said that right now, the majority of the U.S. budget is fixed. Uh, there is no discretion as far as uh, cutting here, cutting there. Seventy said seventy-eight percent of the U.S. budget is fixed, and you know whether whether that's interest on the debt or whether that's uh, your unfunded uh, liabilities, your social benefits, uh, me Medicare, uh, Medicaid, Social Security. Anyway, it, so he basically said that an economy that has lowest unemployment, lowest interest rates should be running budget surpluses, but we're running budget deficits, which means that we're spending as a country $1 trillion more than we bring in in all tax revenue, which is just insane. Uh, so so he is, it, it, that's, that's, his, that's his mindset. So he's always looking for opportunity. Obviously he's going to the Fed to, you know, to, to speak his mind. And, you know, I think he does it where he, he, he's not there to change their mind, right? He's there to give them feedback. He's there to give them information. He's not going to be able to go in there and change their mind because a lot of influential people speak to them. Uh, but he goes in there with just, you know, challenging their thoughts. And I think this is a great way to do it, saying that, you know, we are in these unprecedented times. You want all this growth, right? But yet you're, you're printing your way to growth. And then he also alluded to what I had mentioned the last couple of days, which is financial asset inflation. You're getting growth but they're not getting growth in the areas that they want it in. Uh, and that's mainly uh, due to those that are using low interest rates. Uh, it's mainly businesses and institutions. They're not using it for productive purposes. <laughs> you know, they're, they're not using it to hire more people. They're, they're using it to uh, you know, push up their stock value and, and so forth. That's just, one, that's just one example. All right, so I'll move on. So a few, of the, a few of the other things that he said is when he's making investment decisions, his decision is based on a five to one ratio. So he he loses a lot. And Tony has referred to this before, where you know Paul Tudor Jones would send him trades uh, on you know every, every day from uh, from an accountability standpoint. And a lot of the times he was losing. You know half the time he's losing, but when he wins, he's shooting for a five to one win. And that five to one makes up for all of those losses and some. So it's an interesting way of looking looking at it. Uh, he also alluded to, you know, the, the markets, I think he was referring specifically to the S&P, was at a, uh, <clears throat> a 22 uh, price to earnings ratio, PE ratio. And if you go back to uh, some of the ratios that were pre, you know, 2008, pre uh, 2001 with the dot com crash, you know, we were at 27 to one. So there's still some room to go. And he also made it seem that between now and the end of the elections, uh, and right now, you know, he, he also uh, alluded to the markets being priced for a Trump win, uh, that there's not going to be much volatility. And if anything, there's going to be growth and there's room to grow as well. Uh, and and there's also, you know, room for more stimulus. Uh, I mentioned the other day with regards to QE4, right, which is the repo markets and the Fed being able to provide additional liquidity Okay, by injecting liquidity in, uh, at, uh, with collateral being uh, these high, highly valued uh, assets like treasuries and so forth. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of a Q QE4. Um, but he, he, he basically said, this, and I'll end with this, he said that you know, we're, we're in the time where you can compare it to Arnold Schwarzenegger's movie Pumping Iron, where he was just hugely jacked and lifting all these weights and veins popping everywhere. But it was all based on him, you know, him in steroids and and doing it uh, artificially. Uh, that's what he basically said. And then it made the statement at the end that made everybody laugh, which is, you know, these are the best two hours of your life. It's like 11 p.m., you know, and these are, you know, or 10 p.m., kind of the last uh, last hours of the day. It's going to be the greatest two hours. Uh, but then, you know, and he alluded to whether it's, you know, 
drinking or partying, but you're gonna have a massive, massive hangover once that happens, alluding kind of to the economy as a, as a whole. Uh, and then also get got into uh, where things are going, right? The, the demand has enhanced where he's seeing more socially and environmentally conscious investors. And so he also created a fund that I think is backed by Goldman Sachs called Just Capital. And it's a fund where there uh, are a specific set of criteria for all the different companies that are within this fund that have uh, that are socially environmentally conscious as well as uh, they have a, a more even keel distribution of resources than just fiduciary responsibility to shareholders. And he was alluding to taking care of employees, paying above market wages, um, also being you know charitably conscious and so forth. So it's an interesting, interesting fund. If you guys want more information, I think the ticker symbol is just uh, it's just just J, uh, J U S T, but it's just capital. That's uh, I believe backed by uh, Goldman Sachs. Anyway, Paul Tudor Jones was a great, great speaker. All right, then I'll get into some stuff that's uh, a little bit more exciting. Just two more speakers, and then we're then we're done. Uh, the first was was fascinating. This guy had so much energy, and he was one of those resourceful people. And his history has shown it. His name is Greg Weiler, and right now he runs OneWeb, which is five G based. Uh, it's more of a satellite satellite system. And Tirana, I mentioned them yesterday. Tirana is the biggest competitor to uh, to, to Comcast to broad to broadband. Uh, all right, so first, his background is he laid the majority of fiber in Africa, and it, he has deep, intimate knowledge of, of that country and what's going on there. And I've, I've alluded to, you know, more youth in Africa than, you know, double the population of the United States. Africa is booming. It's, cra it's crazy. And there's a lot of youth. I mean, these are, these are, uh, you know, people under the age of 20 um, amounting to the the hundreds and hundreds of million and they they kind of know what's going on in the other parts of the world and once they're connected it gives them huge opportunities so he started really laying fiber in Africa networking and connecting schools uh, and he has uh, a platform where you guys can go check out kind of the the connectivity of schools in Africa it's called projectconnect.org uh, but he, he said that the youth are, are kind of waiting for this. And he also realized that by experiencing, you know, laying fiber throughout the country that, you know, internet that way is not going to work. And that's where he started to get into the satellite business. And he's been there for several decades now. OneWeb is uh, one of the companies he's currently running. Uh, but it has, uh, it, it purchased rights for a, a particular frequency in space. Uh, this is outside of my realm of understanding, but that frequency is you know, almost exclusively owned by them. And he has some of the more modern satellites that are able to, you know, kind of move and navigate because he said that it's getting kind of busy up in space. And, you know, satellites uh, are getting more uh, dangerous because they can start to uh, collide. And that's not that's not good for any uh, satellite system. Uh, but anyway, he, you know, he, his company OneWeb has figured out some technology to to uh, mitigate those risks. Those risks uh, exist for a lot of other, a lot of other uh, uh, companies that are putting satellites into into space for this purpose. Uh, but Tirana, as I mentioned, you know, the other day, you know, Tirana is the, this first broadband company to compete with Comcast. Uh, Comcast. Uh, basically, it's a six thousand dollar unit. You can attach it to a building, and it provides a very unique way of of five G. Uh, connectivity, one gig up, one gig down, uh, and it's extremely low cost. He basically said that one million dollars in infrastructure cost, just one million dollars, could uh, create uh, one one G up and down for the entire city of Sacramento. Uh, so for just one million dollars in cost, which is just it's, it's amazing. That's where things are going. Uh, and he also alluded to, you know, this is a huge opportunity because 20, 20 million people in the United States uh, do not have good internet, if any internet, which is you know, surprising. So huge, huge opportunity there. But Greg, Greg was a great guest. You can tell he's super you know, socially conscious, very entrepreneurial. You know, the, the money he raised for, for OneWeb or one of the first satellite companies he had was like a billion and a half dollars. And there was no proof that any of it was going to work, but he hustled, grinded, and figured out a way to, to make it happen. So it's very, uh, I, I'm, I'm following him now, and you know, he's, uh, 
just a go-getter, but also is uh, doing a lot of good in different parts of the world, mainly the emerging markets. Uh, okay, the last one, last individual I'll talk about, and then we'll wrap up, uh, is Michael Smorch. And he has worked with lots of different you know, VCs and hedge funds and uh, has, has been around the block. Uh, and I really enjoyed some of his, his thoughts. Uh, so I'll go through my kind of my punch list here. So he, he said that if, if you're looking to construct the way in which you invest based on the last 20 to 30 years, that is a losing strategy. He said everything is exponentially growing and emerging. Uh, and a lot of the, the opportunity is no longer in the U.S. The, the opportunity really is in emerging markets. So he said that there's four forces that will tell the future. First is there's going to be geopolitical alignment. Uh, and he alluded to China. All of these speakers have alluded to China, which uh, you know they they are. And obviously, right now with the coronavirus, you know it's it's going to be interesting to see how uh, that creates disruption. But at the same time, because of that huge dependence on China, there's other uh, you know there's there's other opportunities that are emerging because of this. And this is just the, the nature of capitalism and entrepreneurs. And it mainly had to do with bringing the supply chain closer to the actual end user, which is the 3D printing. And he all and he alluded to 3D printing. So the first is ge geopolitical alignment. He said that you know China, based on its influence, you know it controls uh, the majority of patents for uh, for 4G. I think it's controlled by uh, Huawei. You know there is there's just this continual alignment of these two big forces, the Chimerica. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that uh, so how that comes to fruition. Uh, the next, so number one, again, four forces. Number one is geopolitical alignment. The next one is digital revolution. So I had mentioned the other day, it's it's no longer Moore's law, which is doubling of computing power. It's Nevin's law, N-E-V-I-N-S. Nevin's law is this, ex, it's it's kind of the, the acceleration of acceleration. So he also alluded to that. He said that AI is coming online in so many different areas. Uh, we use it, you know, with our, our database, but AI is essentially creating the, the ease of, of some of the, kind of the back end work in order to make better decisions. And it's coming, uh, it's coming in everything, uh, uh, insurance, uh, investment, school, uh, just on our, on our device, uh, you know, the wearables and being able to have the, the, the information so that we know, hey, eat this, stand up, do some exercise. It's getting uh, more and more accurate to help us live better lives to, to help us to, you know, use our energy to make meaningful decisions as opposed to the stuff we have to spend our energy on today, which can be eliminated. It's fascinating. Uh, the third force is millennials. Uh, he, he alluded to different studies that showed that millennials, uh, you know, pretty much hate all of their parents assets. So they hate gold. Uh, they hate the market <laughs> or they want, you know, essentially different advice, uh, more robo advising, uh, cheaper funds as opposed to speaking to financial advisors. Uh, they uh, also a study if they had an extra thousand dollars in discretionary money, uh, what would they buy? Uh, and I think it was over 40 percent who would buy Bitcoin and all the other options were like a mutual fund, cash, gold. So it's interesting. These are these are it's just a different demographic. And also he alluded to their peak in spending is coming within the next couple of years. And to give some context to that, some reference to that, if you look at the baby boomer peak of spending, that was in the early 80s. And if you look at the boom in the economy in the 80s and 90s, these were the greatest growth years in pretty much in history. Uh, and he said that that's coming very soon in the next couple of years for millennials. All right, third force is environmental change. Now, this was interesting. I, I, I hadn't thought about this before, but he used a great example. He said that there is, there is global warming. One of his biggest clients is a, a kind of a dynasty family in Italy who uh, has massive, massive wineries, and they can't grow. It's too dry now in Italy, and they can't grow like they used to. So they just picked up a massive, massive plot of farming land in Patagonia. So he said that uh, those that are you know, growing are going north and also going south to, uh, toward, toward each of the poles because things are warming up. So it's very interesting. Uh, and then I'll end with this. He basically said that the, uh, so those are the four, four forces, right? So it's geopolitical alignment, digital revolution, millennials, and environmental change. Then he came down to the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail is his way of getting these asymmetric type of returns. 
uh, that the the companies and he gave a couple examples which I'll give at the end but the companies or the industries the environments that are going to have this asymmetric growth have to have a story it has to have a growth story behind it uh, there has to be a massive market so the audience that would take advantage of whatever the sector was okay had to be massive uh, it, it also is something that hardly anyone uh, owns uh, especially institutions they're not there yet but it also has again going to the story it captures the hearts and minds of people it's movement based and then finally it creates forced buying kind of like comcast right if you want good internet you only have one or two options okay so it's a forced buying situation so the example he gave is uh number one space space whether it's you know spacex uh there's also an etf that owns a lot of of these space type of companies which has a ticker symbol of ufo of all of all things which is interesting uh it, it, this is an environment where whether it's the satellite idea uh, there's a guy i met over the last uh, couple of weeks that has a company that does transportation in space both from satellites uh to space the space station so there's a huge huge environment where you know whether it's mining asteroids uh there's just tons of opportunities there uh, so that's one example uh, and, and of course, with the, our new, you know, military force, Space Force, wish I could do a Donald Trump impersonation, but I can't. But that's just another example of where things are going. Uh, and then finally, biotech. That was another example he gave of this kind of holy grail of asymmetric type of uh, opportunities. So it's a growth story, massive market, something hardly anybody owns already, especially institutions. It captures the hearts and minds of people, and it also creates forced buying. Uh, and he said, you know, biotech was one of those other things where, uh, you know, right now we uh, do a lot to uh, respond to getting sick or, uh, you know, pain. But this is, biotech is getting to the preventative. We know in advance what needs to be done in order to avoid that. Uh, so those are just a couple, couple of examples. All right, guys, listen, this was a great, great couple of days for me. Hopefully you guys got a lot out of uh, my thoughts, what I learned, uh, you know, I, I really encourage you to take the opportunity to to come to one of these uh, uh, Tony Robbins events, just the basic one. Just come to the UPW if you haven't been. Uh, un it's Unleash the Power of uh, Within. Uh, I put the contact information for my rep over at Tony Robbins. This is an environment that pushes you outside of your comfort levels. It's an environment that that forces you to grow and and there's so much on the other side of this of, of this environment that will help you with your relationships with business. It'll it'll facilitate an even more meaningful life. And I know that that's what everyone's after, especially myself. And so I, I hope you guys take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, so if you call uh, uh, my my guy uh, Jeff over at Tony Robbins, I put all his information on the show notes. Okay, he'll hook you up. I think it's a little bit too late, maybe for the March event. Uh, but Chicago is in the summer, uh, and then New York City is in the uh, the late fall. So hopefully you guys are able to take advantage of it, because I know that will it will uh, impact your ability to create wealth. It'll impact your ability to take your life to the next level, your business to the next level, your family, your relationships to the next level. So I can't wait to hear your feedback and stories about it. Okay, that's it. I'm off. I'm going to go home. I've been gone for over 10 days, and I'm ready to sleep in my own bed tonight. Uh, anyway, thanks, guys, again. And uh, we'll talk to you. Uh, talk to you next time. Bye.